Welcome to the Your Questions edition of the Digital DJ Tips podcast with me, Phil Morse, brought to you by Digital DJ Tips, the world's biggest DJ school. So if you like this podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. That really helps. And if you're not already a member of the school, come to digitaldjtips.com, join us, click the big join button where you'll get a free DJ gear guide, you'll get a how to DJ book and savings on our courses plus much more. It's all free. So in this edition, I'm going to answer questions from our students, as we always do. Our students join us live for these recordings about things as diverse as DJing with mental and physical disabilities, keeping kids interested in DJing, whether your DJ software database looks after itself or needs a bit of TLC, and indeed what that thing is for in the first place, and lots more topics across the five big areas of DJing, gear, music, mixing, performing, and taking it further. So this is how we teach at Digital DJ Tips. This is what our students get help from us on, and that's what the questions are spread across today. It was a really interesting uh, deep dive session today with a lot of ground covered. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. So our first question in today's show is from David, who says, I'm stone deaf in one ear. And I have difficulty understanding a lot of things around mixing, but especially panning elements in a mix. In other words, you're making music and pan is the control that says, do I want this particular thing, this drum, this synth, this vocal to be left or right or in the middle? And of course, if you've only got one ear, you're going to struggle with that. And by the way, I sympathize. One of my eyes doesn't work when that, well, I've got one eye working at any one time. So I find 3D quite hard. I, I know it's nowhere near as as much of a problem as, uh, as, as losing the hearing in an ear, but I do know what you mean. You know, I, I, 3D glasses don't work on me. You know, 3D specs you get in play parks and stuff. Uh, and so, so yeah, uh, when it comes to knowing what's on the left and what's on the right in a DJ mix or in a produced mix, if you haven't got two ears, you can't do that. I'm with you there, Dave. So Dave says, have I got any tips on what I can do to ensure my mix sounds good in stereo, which is of course how most people listen. I'm going to come back to that point, Dave. Um, Dave says I use something called Ozone Imager, but I only get so much info from that. Uh, can I retain my independence or do I need to get someone to help me? Uh, right, so I'm going to give you a couple of interesting facts here. The first one is that did you know that most club sound systems are in mono? So in other words, when you're listening to music in a nightclub, on a dance floor or whatever, you're not even hearing stereo music. The DJ gear will be switched so that it is feeding into amplifiers and the whole thing will be in mono. And so just to put it into context, it's not something that should stop you or you should be losing sleep over here, David, not at all. Now that said, most released music, probably all released music is in stereo. And you make a good point further on in, in, in what you ask us, David, in saying that sometimes the advice given to DJs is, is you, you, you pan your elements or you move your elements 10 to the left and 10 to the right. Now, what that really means is just a little bit. So in other words, have something so it's sounding a little bit more on the left and a little bit more on the right, but not all the way. If you've ever listened to old records from the 60s, especially when stereo first appeared, you know, the drummer will come in in your left ear and the instruments will come in in your right ear and then the vocal will come in in the right ear and then another vocal in the left and it's like, it's like they realized they could do it and they went crazy. And so this is bad. And if you're listening to music like that on headphones, indeed, some headphones have got an ability to say, look, don't let that happen. Pan it around a bit to make it sound more natural. So you're quite right in that it should be subtle, David. But I think there's two obvious things here. One of them is age old and one of them is brand new. So the age old thing is, yes, get a friend to help. Get a friend to help you understand how your mixes are sounding in stereo when you've done a little bit yourself. But the second thing, which is really brand new, is artificial intelligence or AI. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm sure there will be AI tools that are designed to turn a mono mix into stereo. And I'm sure that they will do a really, really good job. Of course, you won't hear that, so you'll need to get people to tell you what it sounds like. So why don't you have a look for some of those, David? I bet you can get them as plugins for Ableton. I bet you can. Ableton being the kind of industry standard 
music production software that most dance producers use. You might use FL Studio or Logic, there's a couple of others there. But yeah, why don't you look at some AI plugins that might do this for you? I bet they exist. And if they don't exist this week, I bet they exist next week. It's a crazy phase at the moment, the, uh, the AI development, isn't it? It's going on so quickly. Thank you very much, David. That's a great question and I wish you all the best of luck with your music production. So moving to another student question from John who says, I would like to know what the hell is going on when I'm watching a back-to-back -back or B2B performance where DJs are playing one track each. I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on technically when I watch most DJ sets online, due mostly to a certain DJ school. Well, thank you, John. I'm assuming you mean us. Uh, but with B2B, I'm absolutely foxed. Would you please, please explain how it works? So B2B or back to back is when you have two DJs playing a set together. Now, this could be two DJs who regularly play together. And in those instances, quite often one of them ends up being the dominant DJ and the other one ends up being the person selecting or adding effects and so on. Or it could be DJs who are just billed together because, hey, the promoter thought it was a good idea, the DJ thought it was a good idea, and they, they went for it, which is a bold thing to do because this is quite a difficult thing. Back-to-back -back DJing is not easy. And in that instance, it's a lot of fun. And it's something that, as you say, it can be you're watching them and thinking, what are they actually doing here? So back-to-back -back DJ sets, technically, nowadays, are a lot easier than they used to be because modern DJ gear, like the A9 mixer from Pioneer DJ, has got two sets of Q buttons and two sets of headphone sockets on it. So two DJs can plug in and they can both listen to different tracks and different sources, which depending upon what they're preparing for the back-to-back -back mix. So when you see them both on the DJ gear, both pressing buttons on the mixer, that is what they are doing. They're using the modern functions where two DJs can listen at once. It does make this kind of set much more interesting. And that possibly answers your, your query there, John, as to what's going on. With back-to-back -back sets creatively though, a lot of the time nowadays, DJs prefer to play more than one track before handing over to the other DJ because you really can't get into any kind of groove if you just mix in a track and then the next DJ mixes in a track and then you mix in a track. And so unless the DJs know each other very well, that can be a little bit annoying unless they're basically playing out of the same box, so to speak. So a lot of the time now DJs will play maybe two or three songs each. So that is also something that you might see going on. But technically, you're probably watching them using equipment that has got the ability to plug in more than one set of headphones and monitor more than one input because modern DJ gear does let pro DJs do that when they're using it. Thank you very much for the question there, John. So I have a question here from Line who says, uh, thank you for being inspiring and thank you for the great courses. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, you've really helped me developing what started out as a hobby and then as a more serious hobby, this is sounding familiar line. And now I have my first gig. So firstly, congratulations on that. So it's a two hour mobile DJ uh, set. I'm very excited, but I'm also nervous of being judged on my disability uh, because I have to use very large fonts on my laptop due to visual impairment. So you move on and ask another question. And I want to actually cover that first question here first. And I want to reassure you that we have a lot of DJs with disabilities of all types. And in fact, there's quite a few people who've asked questions today with various disabilities and various things that, that worry them about themselves. So you're in, uh, you're in good company here. Don't, don't, don't think this is something that's particularly unusual. We hear it a lot and we're very happy to help DJs with all kinds of challenges in their DJing. But I actually have to say that your inability to read small fonts on a DJ laptop is, is very much, it's almost universal. So I'll give you one DJ among our tutors who has very large fonts on his laptop. No other, no lesser than DJ Jazzy Jeff. So put large fonts out of your mind immediately. No one is going to judge you on the fonts that you are using. So end of story there. Problem dealt with. 
Now, you, the next part of your question is, is a more universal question for mobile DJs. And this is where you say, the organizer has specifically asked me to play some Elton John songs. So how many should I prepare? Right now I've got three in my mini sets. And how about programming? Should Elton John be the first and last songs in my set? So look, this is great. You are thinking very, very hard about the job that you have to do here. This shows you're thinking hard about it, so well done. But let me give you a few pointers as to what's probably really going on here. Organizers, people who book mobile DJs, people whose party it is who are paying your wage, are usually very bad at saying what they want. So by saying, can you play some Elton John? What they're probably saying is, I like Elton John. Can you play some songs that I would like? And so the first thing I would do here is be sure that you have lots of music that is, I would say, Elton John adjacent, right? So this could be just as easy as going into Spotify or your streaming service of choice and putting in a couple of big Elton John songs and pressing that play radio feature, where from there it will play lots of songs that would go well with, hey, Elton John. It bases those algorithms on what people who listen to one artist also listen to. So that would be a really good start. I would also say the organizer is one of, of three heavily involved parties, if you like, and by parties I mean people, in any event. And those three parties or sets of people are the organizer or any organizers, you, because you're the DJ, you're bringing the music, you're bringing your understanding of what makes parties work. So imagine we're drawing a Venn diagram with three overlapping circles. There's you, there's the organizer, but there's one very big one, which is the audience. Because you're really playing for the audience, you're not playing for the organizer. I can guarantee you that if the audience is happy, the organizer is gonna go away happy as well. So you have to have this kind of DJ's filter that's filtering everything you're being asked for from everyone, the audience and the organizer, and applying, bringing in your experience about what you should be playing. And where those three things overlap is the sweet spot of the music that's going to work on that night. Now, as a new DJ, you haven't got an awful lot of experience personally, first-hand experience, but you have secondhand experience because you want to be a DJ and you were inspired to want to be a DJ by listening to other DJs. And I'll bet at one point in time, you said, I can do better than that. You did, didn't you? We all did, that's what gets us into this. So think about the gigs you've been at and think about the DJs you've seen, think about what they've done well, what they've done badly. Pack your music collection accordingly. Put some Elton John in there. Put some tracks that people who like Elton John will probably like in there as well. And certainly don't worry about playing the organizer's favorite Elton John song first and last and in the middle or whatever. Just use that as a starting point. Use that as a launching pad in order to get yourself in the ballpark. And remember, DJs react to what's going on in front of them. The, the music you end up playing is not gonna be the same as the music you thought you would end up playing. And that's the joy of DJing. So don't, don't worry too much about that either. I really wish you an awful lot of luck, Line, in that gig. So if you'd like to get a question on this show, you just need to become a Digital DJ Tips student. Head to digitaldjtips.com, look at our DJ courses, and we do this every month. These are all questions asked live by our students who are here with me as we record this and whose feedback is going to make part of this show as we move on. So thank you very much students for asking these. I'm moving to a question now from Mike who says, uh, hi Phil, hope you're well. I have a lot of extended mixes from techno to trance and you mean extended versions of songs here, Mike. The length of these songs are approximately six minutes. I only upload to Mixcloud and Mixcloud, for those who don't know, is a place to share your DJ sets legally online. Uh, due to my anxiety, so hey, Mike, you're one of many students here who prefer to, to mix at home and share online, so, so you're in good company again. But Mike's question is, what is the rule in using extended mixes as part of my DJ sets? Should I play the whole track or only part of the track? Please help, thanks so much. Uh, this is. Another way of saying a question we get asked a lot, should I quick mix 
or not? Should I be playing a bit and getting out of there, then playing another bit and getting out of there, or letting the tracks breathe in my mixes? So look, I have to say there is no rule. Generally, the less you play of a track, the more the overall excitement level. So if you're playing a lot of tracks in a short space of time, the overall dynamic and energy of your set will be higher. And if you're letting the tracks breathe, it will be lower. But really we need to backtrack here and look at two things. Firstly, the style of music you're playing and what other DJs do in that style. Because if you're playing a, a house set where all the tracks are seven, eight, nine minutes long, then you're probably playing a lot more of the track, but you're probably doing a bit more with those tracks as you play them. If you're playing an open format DJ set, and by open format we just mean lots of tempos, lots of genres and so on, then you're probably mixing in a very different way and playing far less of each track. And the tracks are probably a lot shorter in the first place, you know, pop music today, two and a half minutes, three minutes, in and out, that's it, job done. And so what are other DJs doing? What are the norms in the genre that you play in? And once you've figured that out and you've got a kind of ballpark for what you should be doing, the other thing I would say that I would encourage you to do is, is just backtrack and look at the reason for the show. You're posting regularly on Mixcloud, which is great, but why? Is it because you want to show off new music? You love your scene, you love the producers in your scene, and you love digging out new music that you're pretty sure your audience hasn't heard? And if so, well, you damn well should be playing pretty much all of those songs, shouldn't you? Because no one's heard them before and they might be great songs. Or is it because you're making mixes with the kind of greatest hits of the genre and you're, you're hoping people will listen to your mixes and put them on when they're getting ready to go out or when they're coming back from the club or for parties even? In which case you might want to consider playing a little bit less and stacking those songs against each other a bit more tightly so that there's a bit more, bit more energy. And of course, people already know the songs, right? So it's not like they need to hear the whole song to get 80% of the benefit of it, if you like. So these things should help you to make a decision, decision there, Mike. Uh, so coming in on our live comments, um, Brandon says, Jazzy Jeff uh, has got some really great advice in his course around the mobile DJ stuff that you were just talking about. Yes, our DJ Jazzy Jeff uh, uh, course is a great place for learning how to keep dance floors happy. Uh, Jeff might be a hip hop hero and he might have invented some of the biggest scratch moves in DJing ever made, but ultimately Jeff is a party DJ. Jeff's job is to keep dance floors full from beginning to end. And so you're quite right um, in pointing people towards Jazzy Jeff's course, not only to see that large fonts are all right, uh, but to see that it's okay to, uh, to think about the dance floor first and foremost. Thank you, Brandon, for pointing that out live. So I'm going to go to L Devo's uh, question here, who says, I've got a big showcase gig coming up and I want to raise my game even more for, for it as it's potentially an opportunity to level up for future work. Well, hey, on all DJ gigs, L Devo. Uh, could you share some more producer style live mix transitions that I could practice? Some more producer style live mix transitions. So I can certainly tell you where to find them, El Devo. So if you are a Digital DJ Lab subscriber, Digital DJ Lab is our subscription DJ um, program for people who own our courses. So in other words, if you're a course owner at Digital DJ Tips, we have an extra thing that we can offer you called Digital DJ Lab, Lab which for a subscription gives you kind of like Netflix for DJs. It gives you hundreds and hundreds of mixed transitions, mixed deconstructions, deep dive tutorials, things which are not in our courses, but which are there to keep you on top of your DJ game going forward. So Digital DJ Lab is the place to look for what we call mix deconstructions. And the mix deconstructions in Digital DJ Lab are where we take something that a pro DJ or a working DJ, someone who has done something and published it online has done, and we show you how to do it on your gear. We break it right down. We sometimes give you sheets, which will show you the exact order to do things in. We show you where to put the cue points on your records, and we show you how to line everything up and explain how it's done. So if you're looking for literally the, the cutting edge, world-class transitions that the biggest DJs in the world are using right now, I'd certainly advise taking a look in Digital DJ Lab. 
And so if you are, if I've piqued your curiosity about it, keep an eye on your inbox because we regularly run um, promos where you can take a look at Digital DJ Lab for an unmissable fee for a month. It's usually a dollar or something. So I'm pretty sure there's one of those coming up in the coming weeks. So keep an eye on that. Uh, and then you can have a play around with some mixes in there uh, and see if it's for you. So thank you for that. Sean says, I uh, live in a, sm a very small space. I live in a very small space with very few sockets. Uh, as such, I'm looking for the best USB powered controller. At this point in time, I'm assuming that this will be the Pioneer DJ DDJ Flex 4, uh, which is a two channel controller, and perhaps their Flex 6, which is a four channel controller. But are there any other devices you would recommend or just manufacturers you would recommend with great USB powered devices? Cheers. Right, let's unpack this a bit for those who aren't up to speed with what's going on here. A DJ controller controls your DJ software. It plugs into your laptop and it controls the software. You move controls on the DJ controller, things move on the laptop screen, right? That's, that's what its job is. And the smaller DJ controllers take their power from the laptop that you plug them into. So in other words, there's a lead between the laptop and the DJ controller, and that's where the power comes from, which makes it all very easy to set up. And as Sean says, there's now no need for a power socket to power the DJ controller because it's all coming from the laptop. They tend to be smaller devices, they tend to be cheaper devices, and they tend to be beginner devices. The bigger controllers, the ones that have got more features, tend to take their power from a socket plugged into one of your wall sockets. And that means that they, they need a wall socket, which is one of your issues here, Sean. You're in a very small space with very little room to plug things in. But they also tend to have more features, be bigger, be more expensive. And so the challenge here is finding if you, if you really need something small that works with just a USB, a USB lead in a small space, finding something that has got enough features for you. So the truth is you can't. The truth is as soon as you get more features, you need to plug the thing in and they become bigger. It's a little bit like mini phones, right? You get a small phone and it's got fewer features. And some people like a small phone and they're like, why can't we get all the features of the big phones? It just isn't like that, unfortunately. However, that said, the controller you mentioned, the Pioneer DJ DDJ Flex 4 is a fantastic controller and it is the one we recommend for beginners. So no problem there. The next one up that you recommend by them is called the Flex 6. It's an awful lot bigger and not really that good in, in, in our view. We, we're not fans of the Flex 6. If you are looking for a compact four channel controller, then maybe look at the Newmark NS4 FX, although it has downsides, which it's too long winded to go into here, but basically you need to buy the software, which makes it not quite, quite so much of a bargain as the Pioneer DJ controllers. However, that is the smallest four channel controller that, that works on USB that I can think of. The NS4 FX from Newmark. But it's an interesting one because another way that DJs get around this is that they buy modular controllers, which are little controllers that have got an awful lot of buttons squeezed into them. And then they figure out ways of DJing with those controls without needing the full controller. A lot of DJs do that when they go and DJ out because if you're a lot of Tractor users tend to do this. I don't know why it's such a thing with Tractor. I guess because Tractor, the music genres that Tractor DJs use tend to be the tech techno, tech house, the kind of genres where maybe there isn't so much using of the jog wheels. And so you can use little controllers like the Tractor Control X1 Mark III, for instance, is a very popular controller that you can set up in a modular system that takes up very little space, also takes USB power, and also lets you do some quite interesting things with your music. So if you are a tech house DJ, a techno DJ, and you play electronic music, maybe look at Tractor with one of those controllers, Sean, as a kind of a kind of left field option uh, to help you out there. So uh, I've got lots more questions that you have asked in our student group in Student Hub, which is the group that all students of Digital DJ Tips have 24 seven access to. And that's where all the questions are coming from this month. So thank you everyone who's asked them. And the next question is from Dave. This is another geeky software question. So I'm gonna broaden this one out, Dave, to give some value to people who uh, haven't got your exact issue here uh, and talk a bit about how this works. So Dave says, 
I've got a quick question, re, let's, let's broaden it out to DJ software databases. So all DJ software has a database, right? Take it as read that when you install a piece of DJ software, that software in the background installs a database on your computer where it stores lots of important information about the songs that you DJ with, information that only the DJ software needs to know, right? So if I have a database and I add a thousand songs, and then I delete those thousand songs, and then I add another thousand songs, are there artifacts, little bits and pieces left over from the original thousand in the database? Or is it as if the original thousand never existed? Basically, what I'm wondering, says Dave, is if backing up and then restoring the database from the backup is occasionally necessary to keep it lean and mean. In other words, to paraphrase your question, Dave, if I do an awful lot on my DJ software, will I end up confusing the database and need to do something to it to get back to how it should be working? Sometimes, Dave, sometimes. Where this is an issue, generally the DJ software company can help you with it because they will have seen it before. And quite often there are tools to clean up your database which are available for individual DJ software platforms. But normally, no, you don't have to worry about this. Normally, it's going to be fine, so I wouldn't worry about it. Be confident that should anything ever happen, two things have happened in the background. One, the DJ software has got its own backup that you've probably approved. Quite often on closing DJ software, you can see it making a backup or it'll say to you, you need to make a backup, tick this box and I'll do it for you. So that's always there should something go wrong. But two, you will get help from the DJ software manufacturer should anything ever go wrong. So let me just explain to people who maybe aren't up to speed with this why your DJ software needs to have a database. Say you've got a folder of music on your hard drive, you might think that that's all you need. Well, that's certainly all you need to play the, the music, but DJ software does a lot more with the music. DJ software analyzes your music when you introduce it to the software, and it looks for things like the volume, where the beats are, what musical key the music is in, and it remembers all these things. It even draws a pretty wave form that it can then quickly load when you load that track again. All these things get stored in the database that the DJ software keeps separate from your music. And it's worth knowing this stuff because when you're backing up, because you should always back up your music, when you're backing up your computer, at the very least, as far as DJing is concerned, you should back up the, the music itself and the database and the folder that your software has made. So that's why it's worth knowing that this stuff exists. And then past that, when you start doing things to your music, so for instance, you might change the, the, the way that the software sees the beats so that you get the beats and bars all laid out correctly if the software has struggled with that. It's called beat gridding. You might add playlists and build your own crates, music crates and intelligent playlists and so on within that. All of that also gets stored with the database, not in the music file itself. You might add loops that the software can remember and things like that that help you DJ. So this is why it has a database and this is why it's definitely important to back that up when you back up your music as well. The next question is from Travis who says, I currently have a Mac OS Ventura installed on my laptop. Has anyone had a chance to test Tractor Pro 3 with Mac OS Sonoma? Um, so did you mean that or did you mean Ventura? Anyway, it doesn't matter what order you meant them in. Uh, the important thing here is, and the thing that we're going to cover for all you Mac users is, you should never, ever update your DJ software or indeed your music production software like Ableton or FL Studio without first checking that the current operating system that you want to update uh, works with that software. I guess the only production software you could update pretty confidently would be Logic Pro because it's Apple's own. But any, any other music software, sound software, do not update it until the manufacturer has told you that it's safe to do so. The reason for this is, and this is where Windows users win against Mac users, is that all software that uses sound on Apple Mac computers has to use Apple Mac's core audio, which is Apple Mac's built-in audio drivers. And so when Apple updates its 
operating system, it will also make changes to that. And therefore, the DJ software manufacturers need to check their software in case there's any issues. And if there are any issues, update the way their software is written to work with those audio drivers. On Windows, and if you're a Windows DJ, you will know this because you were probably asked to install an audio driver when you installed your DJ software separately. On Windows, that is because the DJ software, along with other audio software, uses separate audio drivers that don't need to change when the operating system is updated. In other words, when you go from Windows 10 to Windows 11, that part doesn't change, and so the DJ software manufacturer doesn't have to warn you about this happening. Honestly, if you're performing with your laptop and you're an Apple user, my advice would be as soon as they release the beta or the beta version of the next operating system, you're probably safe to install the current one. And until then, hold off because it's not worth the risk. Don't be the guinea pigs uh, when you're performing in front of 50, 100, 200, 5,000, 20,000 people. It's no point, you know, let someone else do that work. It's something that is just there for Mac users and has been there forever. We quite often are over on the Digital DJ Tips website, on the blog, we quite often publish, you know, um, the software companies screaming, please, please tell our users not to update. There's loads of problems. And we'll always say, OK, we'll do it. Uh, and also my friend Mojax often just reposts a video he made years ago uh, where he basically says, do not update your operating system if you're a Mac user. Don't do it. Don't do it. So yeah, this is something that's been going on forever and that's why. So Travis, at the time of recording this podcast, I checked for you and they are saying, do not update your, your, your Mac yet. That's what Tractor was saying as of the middle of March, it's now the, the beginning of April. So I would say hold off a little bit longer. So our next question from a digital DJ tips school student is from Amin, who says, hi, Phil, I've been teaching my nine year old daughter to DJ. She's excited when we do a gig, but her interest wanes between events. Do you have any suggestions on how I can keep her motivated between events? I think firstly, Amin, this is absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I think you're amazing so cool you're doing that. If you can get your daughter hooked on DJing at nine, then there's every chance she'll be hooked on it for life. But there's every chance she won't as well. And I want to just remind you of this because you know it already, Amin. Kids have got such a short attention span and they have got such a wide interest net that they're casting, haven't they? It's literally, it can be within the same sentence that they have two amazing interests that are filling their, their little minds. And I don't think we should worry too much about the fact that they flit around from thing to thing in this way. It's all going in and it's all being remembered. And mark my words, it will come out at some point in the future if it's meant to come out. And getting your daughter hooked on music early is a great thing, but whether it's DJing or just music, hey, you don't know. I would say, make sure she's got access to a streaming service and she knows how to use it and make sure she knows how to play music in the house. In other words, how to click a playlist on her phone and get it to play because she's got a phone, hasn't she? They all have and get it to play on the house Bluetooth speakers or whatever. And this comes from first hand experience, by the way. My daughter, who is now 11, but she was 10 at the time, said to me last year, please, can you teach me to DJ dad and I'm like, hey, you're in the right place. Um, because I want to play the party at school for the younger age group. And so we got her set up on a Newmark mix stream. And the reason we set her up on a mix stream is that it's got built-in speakers for practicing. Uh, it doesn't need a laptop and it can access Tidal over Wi-Fi, which means she had instant music. Brilliant for a 10 year old. And so I taught her to get the Tidal app on, on her phone and build playlists and then how to access those playlists on the unit and practice. And I showed her the echo out and I showed her how to do a quick cut from track to track. And I taught her what we just call the fade. We just fade one track out, hit play on another. And said, look, this is all you ever need. So just practice transitioning with these three transitions and start, start practicing. And she did, and she did quite a, a small amount of practice, I have to be honest. She really did, but she did enough for her. She was confident in her own mind. 
that she could do the job. And I went down to the school, we set the equipment up and uh, she went down there to play, play at 6.30 in the evening for the, the seven-year-olds and the eight-year-olds. And then we were really nervous. I, I secretly got her teacher on a WhatsApp and was saying, how's she doing? And uh, the teacher was saying, she's doing amazing. She's doing brilliant. And uh, so we were, we, were, we were pleased. And then just when it was time to go and collect her at eight o'clock, we got a text saying, um, I want to stay and DJ for the older age group as well, whose party was next. Um, I want to stay and DJ for them as well. It's been so good. So she carried on and DJed for the older age group as well. She ended up playing a three hour DJ set to two age groups, three hours on her first ever gig. And to tell you the, the funniest bit of it all, she had her friend on her phone with Tidal open and her friend was taking requests. And if she didn't have the request, her friend was adding it to a Tidal playlist which my daughter was then accessing on the gear and playing directly from Tidal in front of the school, literally ad-libbed, literally in the moment. There was no preparation at all. Now, this is pretty advanced stuff that I wouldn't encourage any DJ to do. I didn't show her how to do it. She figured it out because we live in a, we live in a, a community here where we've got a lot of Spanish speakers and a lot of English speakers. We're the English speakers. And so most of her music was English, but a lot of the Spanish speaking kids wanted Spanish language tunes. And so they were finding them and playing them literally on spec. I mean, that is, I, I, I've coached DJs who've been doing this for decades who are too scared to do what I just described in, in a gig. So the point is here, she got totally into it. She was very good at it. And she hasn't touched or even mentioned DJ gear since. But I know that it's in her. I know she can do it. And I know at some point this is going to come back in some way. So what I'm saying to you, Amy, is don't push her. Don't make her feel she has to do this. Bring her along to gigs, get, get her excited at gig time, but just maybe encourage her to collect the music that she likes in the meantime. That's the key thing, because that's just as much part of DJing as the actual DJing. Collecting the music you like Ultimately, if she can do that from nine years old up to 90 years old, she's going to have a really good music collection. So get her involved in that now and maybe talk to her about it every now and then. But I would say don't push her too hard on this. It's something that kids, their, their minds are different to ours. We, we flip everywhere as kids and, and we should. So anyway, I wish you the best of luck. It's, it's given me goosebumps having this conversation because the, 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 it, it's so inspiring what, seeing young people get involved in DJing and music at such a young age, isn't it? So well done, Aiming for that. That's where we're going to leave it for today. Thank you to our amazing student community for joining me on that live recording that you just heard and for picking all the questions. Thanks again, everyone who took part in there. And if you'd like to have your question on one of these podcasts, then you just have to become a Digital DJ Tips student and ask your question in our student community. Go to digitaldjtips.com, take a look at our courses and join us. Anyway, I'd really appreciate it if you've enjoyed this, if you could leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Meanwhile, get good, get out there, make the moments, and I hope you'll join me on another podcast very soon.